What's the strangest thing you can do with a deceased pet? Make art. Like with these two creatures, for example, a male and female devil's flower mantis that I raised. After they had passed away, I pinned and dried their bodies and created a custom clay base for them. But today, I've got something different in mind. My diabolical plan is to create a sarcophagus for a mantis which recently joined the afterlife. Now this isn't the exact specimen that I'm referring to, but rather a juvenile example of the species commonly called Darth Vader mantis. Warning: If you do not wish to see insect dissection, skip to the pinning at a minute 30. This is Eileen, a recently deceased Darth Vader mantis. The first thing I do is make an incision in the abdomen so that I can pull out all the guts, which gloves are probably helpful for this if you're a wimp, because it's a pretty gross but sometimes satisfying process. I use a cotton swab to clean out the remnants and then pack the abdomen full of antifungal powder. For pinning, I'm using a small piece of foam with grid lines on it to kind of help me get things lined up and symmetrical. I'm also using regular old fabric pins, which the experts would tear me apart for, but I think they work for my purposes. My goal in pinning is to make sure that I'm displaying this mantis in a way that really shows off all its crazy details. Now it's time to get this old gal dried out. I like to expedite the process by putting it on the top shelf of the oven on the lowest setting for a couple of hours. Now the body is dry and set in place, so it's time to start on that sarcophagus. I made a texture slab and roller so that I can achieve a stone look out of clay. I take my slab and mold it into a rough sarcophagus form, and then I do a little bit of surgery to clean and tighten it up a bit. Also, what better to simulate a rock texture than with a real rock? For the base, I'm using a technique that requires me to slice into a solid piece of clay and peel away those sections, which kind of leaves a rough stone carved look. After that, I can start molding the head that goes on the outside of the sarcophagus, as well as creating a textured slab that I'll use for some of the other details. Once the head is sculpted, I can finally place it on the front. I mark out where it needs to go, score and slip, and then press it on firmly. Oh, and you can't forget about the headdress. That's an important detail. So I'll just clean it up a little bit, and here's what we're looking at so far. However, it still needs to be able to open and close. I'm using these small hinges that I got at the hardware store. I start by scoring a straight line into the piece, which will act as the door, and then I mark out where the hinges need to go. Now I can carefully cut into those lines that I created earlier to detach the door. You can see that it's a little bit rough on the inside, but I'll clean that up before firing. Since this is stoneware clay, it has to be fired in a kiln to almost 2000 degrees to harden. Once the kiln is finally cooled, I can take the piece out and now it is turned into bisque or stone. To color this piece, I'm going to start by adding in an underglaze wash. Underglaze is essentially a paint that gets fired on and fused to the piece. Once sufficiently coated, I take a damp sponge and wipe off the underglaze which leaves it behind in the cracks and crevices and really accents all the textures and details. Next is to use this decrepit concoction, which is just a bunch of pieces of scrap metal that I've had soaking in vinegar for a while. 
This creates an iron oxide stain that I can wash over the piece. Once it's fired again, it'll create a nice rusty finish. The kiln is cooled and the color looks great, so let's get it home to finish it up. I'm using craft foam to fill the inside of the sarcophagus and a small piece of plexiglass with plastic film to mark out the shape of the inside. Then I peel off the plastic and use that as a template to mark and cut out the desired shape. I thought that a box cutter would slice through the foam pretty easily, but it made a very rough cut so I just used the scissors to clean up the edges a little bit. It took a few haircuts to get a proper fit, but now it's time to cover it in fabric. The cut on that fabric isn't so pretty, but once it's glued and wrapped around the back, you'll never even notice it. At first, the fabric looks stiff and boring, but once pressed on the inside of the sarcophagus, it gets some nice organic wrinkling. Next, I tape the lid shut to install the hinges. I'm using a two-part epoxy that I mix with a toothpick, and I use that to carefully place epoxy down into the screw holes. Then I put on the hinges and press the screws into place, and then tape them up. After the epoxy has had a few hours to cure, I'm confident enough to take off the tape. The lid gets a test run, not that I could change much at this point anyways, but it works pretty well. Now, I can finally get Eileen ready for her new resting place. I take out all of the pins, and you can see that the mantis has held its form. Now, I could glue it directly to the fabric cushion in the sarcophagus, but I opt to glue a pin on her back instead. This allows me to play around with the placement and get it just right. Finally, the piece is complete and ready for display. I'm quite happy with how this piece turned out. It has many different facets for appreciation. Although I like the closed sarcophagus look on its own, the real spectacle lies on the inside. I have a deep appreciation for these creatures and really want to highlight the insane details and mechanisms of their body. I would love to know your thoughts on this piece overall. And if you've enjoyed this process, I'd like to invite you back next time while I make strange things.